Hello, so um, I'm delighted to be able to have the chance to talk today to Dr. Lauren Hall Liu about um, a chapter that she's recently had published, um, which is about uh, tourists' attitudes to Scottish linguistic variation. Lauren is a, a lecturer in um, social linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. So, hi, Lauren. Hello. So I suppose the first question, um, why did you do the study? What, what, what sparked off your interest in that? Well, in sociolinguistics, one of the things that a lot of people study is language attitudes. And language attitude studies generally look at how people in a community feel about the different ways of speaking in their community. So usually, you know, what, what way of speaking, what accent, what dialect is intelligent or friendly, and those are usually different things. <laughs> and uh, a lot of work has looked at that sort of uh, within community study. Um, and that community, community could be as large as, as the UK, so seeing what people in the south of England think about Scottish accents, that sort of thing. Um, and this project is specifically looking at what visitors to a place think about variation. So it's a different angle, and it came about because of work in collaboration with a tourism researcher. So in tourism studies, they're interested in looking at how places construct authenticity to market it to tourists. And so how did you, where did you find your, your tourists and were they sort of primarily um, fr from England or were they sort of foreign speakers? I mean, could, could they even tell the difference between, a, between variation in Scottish accents? Yeah, it's a good question and it's one of the things that we wanted to find out. So um, we were interested in the role of a tourist's motivation to travel and how that might interact. So the idea is that some tourists really do go looking for authentic things and others are just going to look for a good time. Um, so the way that we kind of uh, played with that is to capitalize on the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And so most of our data collection happened uh, right here during the Fringe Festival and um, specifically targeting people who were here because of the Fringe and then getting other tourists who were here not because of the Fringe and comparing those two. And what sort of questions did you ask them? Um, so we first wanted to find out why they were there. Um, so we asked them like why, why they came, what they had done, how interested they were in Scottish culture, in experiencing authenticity, those kinds of questions, and just a bit about their background so we could figure out if their uh, linguistic and cultural background played a, played a role. And then we specifically asked them to rate accents. And so did you go into the study with a set of expectations of what might come out and, and how did that work out? We expected that they would want to hear a Scottish accent on the Royal Mile from a tour guide more often than they'd want to hear it from someone selling them a train ticket um, or the Fringe Festival. And in that particular case, we were surprised to find out that people wanted to hear Scottish accents when buying a train ticket just as much as when getting a tour on the Royal Mile. We also thought we might hear a difference or, or find a difference between native English speakers and non-native English speakers, because um, like you said earlier, maybe they can't hear the difference. But non-English speakers have really strong and equal opinions about these things to native English speakers, so we didn't find any difference there. And was there anything else that was surprising? I suppose Scottish is sometimes seen as difficult to understand or you might not uh, sort of be able to comprehend it or they might have to slow down. Or, or did anything sort of contradict what you'd, what you'd thought might happen? So we did find differences between the questions about light Scottish accents and heavy Scottish accents. And that's what we expected to find. So people really wanted to hear whatever they imagine a light Scottish accent to be. And they were quite mixed on the heavy Scottish accent. That was the accent more likely to be rated uh, with more negative attributes. Um, but by and large, I think my favorite result to come out of it, which maybe is a little surprising, is we just asked them this simple yes or no question. We asked, would you rather hear an accent that is authentic to Scotland, even if you didn't understand it? And the majority of people said yes. <laughs> so it's so important to them to hear something that they think is authentic, um, that even if they don't understand it, that's, that's, part of, that's part of actually what they are here to experience. So I suppose the, the next thing is, do, do you see any sort of practical applications for your for your findings in a way could I guess it could be useful to the Scottish Tourist Board for, for adverts or do they already is that already a kind of um 
thing that they use? Right, so it was interesting because we started this project in 2012, and at the time there was nothing on Visit Scotland, which is like the big um, uh, website uh, for um, t tourism in Scotland. There was nothing on Visit Scotland that was about accents. And then around, I think it was February 2013, suddenly there was a single page that popped up that was about accent pride. And it was um, talking about how, um, despite the fact that people find it to be uh, um, a, a single accent that's coarse and hard to understand, actually it's uh, very varied, regionally diverse, some are more or less easy to understand, and and um, it had this nice little video that had um, a single performer performing all the different accents, the regional accents around Scotland. And so it's this one page, and it, and it was starting to get at basically what the implications of our study would be, which is that accent is, in a way, what tourism scholars call an intangible commodity, that it is something that the tourist seeks when they travel and it is something that could become a product in a so way. So it's obviously it's something that people are more and more interested in, accents as a, a kind of tourist commodity. Have mm. you thought about perhaps extending the study to say the north of England where there's a lot of mm. variation and increasing tourism I suppose? Would you do the same study somewhere else? Yeah, no that's a really interesting idea. I think it's a, a really viable idea. So there are other projects being done by other scholars across the world um, the the heart of this recent literature on language as a tourism commodity is coming out of um, the Francophone Canada area um, and there's a, a lot of people over in Denmark looking at particular varieties of Danish uh, and and their use uh, in the tourism uh, industry as well. Um, there's been work in Wales and the use of Welsh. Uh, so there's a lot of different spots around the world that have been um, leading the way. So uh, what, what next for the project? Um, so there's two directions that we're hoping to take. One of them is to do the same thing but expand the types of tourists that we get. So have more of the non-native English speakers, people from other countries that we haven't looked at yet, and also specifically to look at something called the ancestral tourist. And that is the tourist who comes here searching for their roots. Right. Um, so this is a particularly common kind of tourist in Scotland, um, especially with visitors from uh, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, Canada. And so we're wondering if those tourists might be specifically interested in authenticity in accents and if we might find a, a difference between them and other tourists. Um, and then the second way we're going is we're talking to tour guides. Uh, so a couple years ago, my research assistant interviewed 38 tour guides in Edinburgh and specifically asked them how much they thought about this. So how much they tried to play up interesting accent features and language features in their tours. And we're just starting to look at those interviews now and we're starting to see that there's a big difference between types of tour guides. So there's a range between the ones that are rather expensive and do multi-day long trips and those that do the free tours on the Royal Mile, that they have very different approaches to the use of accent as a commodity in the tourism industry. So um, you must be very fond of Scottish accents. You must have heard quite a lot of them now. Do you have a do you have a favourite one you, yourself? <laughs> do I have a favourite one? <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I can't say that I do have a favorite one because I'm still trying to come to grips with all the variation that exists in Edinburgh. Um, so I've only been in Edinburgh for five years and uh, there's all these um, sayings about how the accents are different from this neighborhood to that neighborhood and there's other things beyond just neighborhood that matter quite a lot. And so I'm interested uh, linguistically in trying to figure out what the lay of the land is exactly. Um, but no, I don't have a particular favorite. <laughs> No, no. 